President Trump is making the rounds in the Middle East. We're going to look at his speech in Saudi Arabia, the good, the bad, and we're going to show you portions of an episode from What Would Mohammed Do on anti-Semitism. You're going to learn something today, friends. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Before we begin looking at President Trump's speech, I want to play for you excerpts of episode five from our new series, What Would Mohammed Do? Islamic Terrorism Explained. This will show you from the words of Mohammed why peace in the Middle East that includes Israel is almost certainly never going to happen. Watch for yourself. The apostles said, Kill any Jew that falls into your power. Our attacks upon God's enemy cast terror among the Jews, and there was no Jew in Medina that did not fear for his life. The last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews, and the Muslims would kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree. And the stone or a tree would say, Muslim or the servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Never again, say the Jews. Never again will they allow themselves to be herded to concentration camps, slaughtered, without the ability to defend their families and their homes. Never again. Most of the world agrees and has stood behind Israel's right to defend itself as a nation and the Jewish people's right to self-defense. Western nations, from America to Germany, have forcefully condemned any strain of anti-Semitic bigotry that shows its ugly head inside their nations. But from Muslim terrorists, and sadly, from certain Muslim nations, a very different message is heard. The shrill call for the death or enslavement of the Jews and even the annihilation of the state of Israel. Iranian Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, after negotiating a nuclear deal that could be fatal to millions of Jews, said these words. God ruling there would be no Zionist regime in 25 years. Second, during this period, the spirit of fighting, heroism, and jihad will keep you worried every moment. At the time of the Paris terrorist attacks in 2015, ISIS released a video threatening a massive slaughter of Jews. They said, This is a serious and clear announcement to all the Jews, the first enemy of the Muslims the first enemy of the Muslims. What about the Meccans, you might ask? Well, the Meccan people, who had originally resisted Muhammad's message, ultimately converted to Islam after Muhammad's army invaded and captured Mecca. Their conversion was with a sword at their throat, but it still counted for Muhammad. But the Jews in Arabia would not convert. In spite of Muhammad's preaching, his negotiations, and then armed conflict with multiple Jewish settlements in Arabia, they steadfastly refused to accept him as a prophet or convert to Islam. When ISIS calls Jews the first enemy of the Muslims, it shows they are living out the storyline of Muhammad's hatred of the Jews from his day. When Muhammad emigrated to Medina, he found large and wealthy Jewish tribes steeped in history and theology regarding Noah, Abraham, Moses, and other Old Testament prophets. Like the Jews, Muhammad prayed toward Jerusalem. 
he told his followers in chapter 5, verse 5 of the Quran, that it is lawful for Muslims to eat the food that the Jews eat. He observed one of their fasts. Don't go away, friend. When we come back, I'm going to play another segment of our series, What Would Muhammad Do on Anti-Semitism? And we're going to look at President Trump's speech. I'll be right back. Have Muslim terrorists hijacked the peaceful religion of Islam? Or is there more to the story? The answer lies in the life of one man, Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Muslim terrorists see themselves inside a 1,400-year-old story, a narrative that focuses on specific events in the life of Muhammad. We are going to look at Muhammad's life using their most sacred literature. We will look at Muhammad at the Battle of Badr. We'll see him deal with those who mock him. We'll see the times when he used deception. We'll witness Muhammad's anti-Semitism. And yes, we will discuss Muhammad and his teachings concerning sex, slavery, and jihad. Friend, if you want to understand Islamic terrorism, get this series today. We're going to show you an excerpt of What Would Muhammad Do? The segment on anti-Semitism. Remember, if you want to get the entire series, you can find it at our website. In the next segments of the program, we're going to look specifically at President Trump's speech, which he delivered in Saudi Arabia. And now, Muslims and anti-Semitism. Shortly after he settled in Medina, he told the Jews that he was a prophet, a prophet in the line of Moses, that he was their prophet. The Jews considered this absurd. He was an Arab. At points, they ridiculed him, pointing out his incorrect retellings of Old Testament stories. He was illiterate. There were inconsistencies and alterations with his supposed revelations in the Quran. They were never going to confess that he was the messenger of God to them. This angered Muhammad greatly, and, and frankly, it troubled him. He was no match for their scholars and their knowledge of theology and Old Testament history. And worse yet for Muhammad, their insolence and their knowledge might undermine his credibility with his followers. His conflict with the Jews began in earnest after the Battle of Badr. He gathered the Jewish tribe of Banu Kainuka in the market of Medina and warned them to accept him as their prophet. Beware, lest God bring on you the like of the retribution which he brought on the Meccans, Quraysh. Accept Islam. For you know that I am a prophet sent by God. You will find this in your scriptures and in God's covenant with you. They scoffed, accusing him of being deluded. Muhammad, do you think that we are like your people? Do not be deluded by the fact that you met a people with no knowledge of war and that you made good use of your opportunity. By God! If you fight us, you will know that we are real men. As far as the Jews were concerned, there was nothing supernatural about Muhammad's victory at Badr. It was certainly not a sign from God that he was a prophet in the line of Noah and Abraham and Moses. Muhammad had simply won a desert battle. Muhammad would not tolerate Jews undermining his claim that his victory at Badr was a miracle. al Tabari records. Gabriel brought down the following verse to the messenger of God. And if thou fearest treachery from any folk, then throw back to them their treachery fairly. When Gabriel had finished delivering the verse, the messenger of God said, I fear Banu Qaynuqa. It was on the basis of this verse that the messenger of God advanced upon them. Muhammad said he feared the Jews, not because they were out to kill him, but because they would not accept Badr 
as a sign from God and because they undermined his story and also because they said he was deluded. This enraged him more and more as the months progressed. He wanted them dead for their insolence. He gathered his armed men and laid siege to their homes and their neighborhoods. After 15 days, the Jews surrendered. They were fettered and he wanted to kill them. One of Muhammad's recent converts named Abdullah grabbed Muhammad's shoulder and kept urging Muhammad to spare the Jews. Treat my friends well. The chained Jews and the Muslim crowd fixed their eyes on Muhammad. Muhammad's face was black with rage. Confound you, let me go. The man replied, no, by God, I will not let you go until you treat my friends well. 400 men without armor and 300 with coats of mail who defended me from the Arab and the non-Arab alike. And you would mow them down in a single morning? So the messenger of God said, They are yours. Let them go. May God curse them. And may he curse Abdullah with them. These Jews escaped with their lives, but they were not free to return to their homes and businesses. Then the messenger gave orders to expel them, and God gave their property as booty to his messengers and the Muslims. The Banu Khainuga did not have any land, as they were goldsmiths. The messenger of God took many weapons belonging to them and the tools of their trade. They were driven out of Medina. Most of them fled to Syria. Friend, these quotes come right from their most sacred literature. I hope you're beginning to understand why, while President Trump is in Saudi Arabia making a speech, the Saudi government won't even recognize Israel's right to exist. I'll be right back. Over the years, I've had the privilege of interviewing some incredible guests, like Dr. Alan Keyes, former ambassador to the United Nations, like Dr. Elvita King, niece of the slain civil rights activist, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Judge Roy Moore, two-time head of the Supreme Court in Alabama. These interviews are so powerful, so memorable, and so inspirational we have decided to make them available to you on two DVDs for only a gift of $15. That's it. If you love this ministry, you want to support us, and you want these to show to your family and friends, or just for yourself, to watch at your leisure, get them today. Call 304-289-3700. That's 304-289-3700. Tomorrow and Wednesday, we are going to show in the rest of its entirety all of episode five in our series, What Would Muhammad Do? That is the episode on anti-Semitism, and it explains what motivates Muslims. It's critical that we understand that to get inside the Muslim mind, you have to study the words and the deeds of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. We would look at the declaration, the founding document of Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, and see the anti-Semitism there and say, oh, that's horrible. It comes right from the mouth of Muhammad. So while I appreciate the fact that President Trump is following in the footsteps of every American president since World War II, trying to broker peace in the Middle East, until our president, any president from any party, gets it in his head that the foundational documents of Islam call for the enslavement of Jews. They can never have a starting point that even makes sense. All right, I'm going to read to you some of the excerpts from President Trump's speech. And I'm doing this because truth matters. And I want you to see where He's making statements that are good and that are 
doable and then where he's making statements that are just not possible and they're written by policy wonks, okay, from the Pentagon or from the State Department who don't understand Israel. And I'm sorry, they don't understand Islam and its relationship to Israel or to Christianity. So let me begin. <clears throat> President Trump said, our goal is a coalition of nations who share the aim of stamping out extremism and providing our children with a hopeful future that does honor to God. That's a great goal. All of us would be saying, yes, the problem is, listen, later today we will make history again with the opening of a new global center for combating extremist ideology located right here in this central part of the Islamic world. So this new think tank, the Global Center for Combating Extremist Ideology, is going to be located in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia does not recognize Israel's right to exist. Saudi Arabia has the death sentence for homosexuals. Saudi Arabia has the death sentence for somebody who denies that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Saudi Arabia does not have freedom of speech. Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, it's against the law to have a church or a synagogue. Now, maybe I'm just a little too American, but that sounds like an extremist ideology. <laughs> Doesn't it to you? The fact that women are forced to wear the clothing that they wear when they go out in public, that they can be beaten, that they can be forced to stay and remain in Islam, that they can't convert to Christianity. I mean, doesn't that sound like an extremist ideology? This is like the fox is watching the hen house. It's absurd. On its face, it's absurd. I continue. The groundbreaking new center represents a clear declaration that Muslim-majority countries must take the lead in combating radicalization. And I want to express our gratitude to King Salman for this strong demonstration of leadership. I wonder how many of the leaders of these Muslim countries, because there were representatives from about 50 Muslim countries there, I wonder how many of them were snickering. I wonder how many of them were doing everything in their power to suppress laughter because this is actually funny this is what he said president trump and i continue here at this summit we will discuss many interests we share together but above all we must be united in pursuing the one goal that transcends every other consideration that goal is to meet history's great test to conquer extremism and vanquish the forces of terrorism you do understand that the number one financier of terrorism in the world are Saudis, people of Saudi Arabia. Number one financier of terrorism in the world. So this is almost comical. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. I've got to take a break. But again, combating to conquer extremism. I don't know of any government in the United or in the world that is more extreme than Saudi Arabia. I'll be right back. What Would Mohammed Do? Islamic Terrorism Explained is the best movie series documentary ever produced on the life of Mohammed and Islam. How do I know? Because it's what critics are saying. John Moore, radio host and author said, I learned more from what would Muhammad do about Islam and Islamic terrorism than I've learned from everything I ever read and watched in my entire life. Best-selling author, Dr. Bill Warner said, what would Muhammad do is the best movie series, TV production on the life of Muhammad and Islamic terrorism that has ever been produced. Friends, this is what the experts are saying. No one has ever done what we've done. I encourage you to get one, two, four copies Call 304-289-3700, that's 304-289-3700, or order it at the address or the website that you see on the screen. Friend, I want to talk to two distinct groups of people, those who can make a contribution 
and those who need a scholarship. This program takes money, and I'm asking those of you who can make a contribution to help us. But you're not just supporting this show, you're supporting people who want access to this information, and guess what? We give it to them for free. You can get my writings on Islam. You can get my book, A Humble Plea. You can get multiple teaching series on how to do a press conference, how to run for office, how to be a public advocate. Go to our website. We've got shows reaching all the way back to 2010, which are cataloged by topic. So for those of you who can help us with this broadcast, please make a contribution. The rest of you, go to the website. The stuff is for free. And if you want to call in your contribution, call 304-289-3700. I'm going to continue reading from President Trump's speech in Saudi Arabia. Young Muslim boys and girls should be able to grow up free from fear, safe from violence, and innocent of hatred. This is not possible in Saudi Arabia. The very curriculum of their elementary and high schools is a breeding ground for hatred. They are taught to hate the Jews. They are taught to hate Christianity and thereby Christians because we're all infidels. That we have mingled gods with God. That we have called Christ God and therefore we're blasphemers. So this is a pipe dream. He says, with God's help, this summit will mark the beginning of the end for those who practice terror and spread its vile creed. Again, the problem is the creed of Islam from the dawn of Islam was to kill polytheists or to give them a chance to convert to Islam with a sword at their throat. And that's, that's how Muhammad spread the faith, right? So, how are they going to mark the beginning of the end of those who practice terror and spread its vile creed? All of North Africa was swept into Islam and Christianity had its back broken there or it was enslaved by the spread of violence. Syria, Turkey. Turkey used to be Christian. You've heard of the book of Ephesians. You've heard of the book of Galatians. These are areas of Turkey that once thrived with churches. They're almost all extinct. The most magnificent church in the world at that time was Hagia Sophia. It was captured. Everyone in the building was killed. Priests killed. Nuns raped and killed. And then they turned the, the beautiful church into a mosque. That is the creed of Islam. That is the history of Islam. So he's say, President Trump is saying these things that I'm thinking, the people in the room have got to be laughing under their breath. He said, but this future can only be achieved through, the, through defeating terrorism and the ideology that drives it. The ideology that drives terrorism is the faith of Islam. They don't even consider themselves terrorists. That's why a horrific number of people polled in, if my memory was it was Afghanistan, and it was way over 50% of the people believed that ISIS and Al-Qaeda do in fact represent Islam. Now you would look at that number and go, how can they even think that? Because they're Muslims and they know their own history. That's where our State Department and, the, and our players in the Pentagon have completely missed it. They don't understand Islam. They don't understand the Muslim mind. So they can never, never understand what motivates these people. Until we grasp what's going on inside of the Muslim brain, the Muslim psyche, and, it's, and what that psyche is for a social order, we will never understand what drives them. Now remember, while President Trump was making this speech, it's against the law in Saudi Arabia to build a church or to build a synagogue. I'm out of time. I'm, I'm encouraging, I'm inviting you Go to my website, randallterry.com, and watch the first episode of What Would Muhammad Do for Free? We've shown you today, and we're going to show you tomorrow parts of episode five. Please get the video series for yourself. Get the movie series so that you can understand Islam, so that you can get inside of the head of the Muslim terrorist. 
And then maybe if our government will begin to see through the, the lens of reality, maybe we can fight and win. Thank you.